we want to start with, I'm sure you can see our Juneteenth, our Freedom Day uh, uh, graphic there, which you will see all over the place in celebration of uh, various events that are going to go on this week. But we want to start with some reflections from a Mercy alum from 2001, and his name is Andre Early. And we had spoken to him and just thought he was super interesting on this. So let's listen to what he has to say. Everyone can counter, you know, Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter. Um, but my question will always be this. Well, if All Lives Matter, what are you doing to ensure that all lives do matter? I really believe that in order for us, and I, and I use this as a professional as well as a personal, um, in order for us to continue to grow, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And the conversations that really need to take place are going to be uncomfortable. Unfortunately, for some, you know, history is hard. It's painful. It's very painful. But we can't erase it. We can't. We 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 can't live it over again. What we can do is learn from it, and then you have an understanding as to why uh, this movement is still is still on the forefront. Okay, so I guess this conversation succeeds on the degree to which it is uncomfortable, right? I mean, we are going to talk about the celebration of this holiday, but hopefully we will touch on some uncomfortable themes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Edie Magnus, your um, host for this morning. We are discussing Juneteenth, um, which is happening uh, three days from now, but for which there are celebrations, many celebrations going on all of this month. And we're gonna do a deep dive into all sorts of aspects about this holiday, the history, the way in the present it is celebrated, the, the currents all around us now and how they influence um, what this day means to people. And I wanna introduce now, oh, before I introduce everyone, I want just, just two housekeeping notes. So we have the chat room open. And if you hear something that you don't understand or you wanna follow up on, you can put a note in the chat and we'll see it. And we try to get to as many of these as we can. And we're recording this. So we'll put it up um, afterwards on our social channels. Um, notably our YouTube channel, and we'll send you a link and so you can share it with whomever you might want to share it with. Um, and somebody let Annette in the room, by the way. Annette is in the waiting room and we need to admit her. Okay. An all-purpose uh, host for you this morning. So I want to introduce our guests, and I'm hoping that um, Stephanie, we can spotlight each one of them, I think. Yes. As I introduce them, or just wave so people know who you are. Nakia James Jenkins is with us. She is a partner at OnRamps, an executive search firm that focuses on hiring executive leaders committed to equality and inclusion in the social sector. She is a Mercy alum. She graduated with an MSOL in 01. I'm right with you. I got my SOL in 2014, Nakia. Um, and she is a member of Mercy's Alumni Council. And <clears throat> excuse me, our graduates know her because every year she sends this fabulous message of congratulations to them that we put up yeah. on, our, on our events. So Nakia's with us. We're going to lose her about halfway through. So um, Nakia, I hope we get to all the things that we want to talk about with you before you have to go. Thank then you. Robert Murray is with us. Uh, Robert, wave if you would. He is an assistant professor of history only until September 1, when he will be elevated to an associate professor of history. His research focuses on African-American history. His first book, Atlantic Passages, is on colonial Liberia, was published by the University Press of Florida this year. And he has another book he's working on as well that um, time permitting, we'll ask him to tell us about a little bit. And David Collins is here with that fabulous Juneteenth background behind him, by the way. He has worked at Mercy College for more than 20 years. He's the director of TRIO SSSP, 
which is a program that works with underrepresented populations in higher ed to increase retention and graduation rates. Those two things are the holy grail for us. That's our, you know, our mission and our reason for being is to increase uh, the degree to which our students get in stay in and get through all the way to the finish line. So David is involved in that. He is a Mercy alum who graduated with a bachelor's degree in 03 and then got his MBA in 2011. And David, I'm just gonna, sorry, I have to brag about you again. So what is the most recent honor, would you please share with us that you received at uh, the Faculty Recognition Day? Um, at our recent Faculty Recognition Day, um, I was honored to receive my master's in pedagogy um, from Mercy College. Which means, let's just uh, drill down on that one more second. So, it, so what you received that, which I saw Grace, um, she, is, she also was a, um, a co-honor with that same degree. Uh, you re we receive our master's in pedagogy from the college once you've reached at least a minimum of 20 years at the college serving Mercy College and our students and our community. So it's in recognition of the profound effect you've had on a lot of lives. Yes. Okay, there's another person in our waiting room. See, I get all these little notes on my screen here. So let's let them in. And I want to start so that this is very grounded in what we're talking about and not just Juneteenth celebrations. I want to talk, talk, start with the wording of the information that reached Texas on that very famous day in history. And if we could Put that slide up. You've seen it a couple of times there, but if we could put the slide up and David, can you just read it out loud for us? I would be honored. Juneteenth, 1865. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. Sort of seems amazing that that has to get spelled out, right? Does it move you when you say the words? Like, I, do, you, do you say these words in your Juneteenth celebrations to your children in your personal life at all? Do you reflect on those very words? I think I personally, do not, I do not recite this, these words verbatim, but I paraphrase them. I have young children, but I paraphrase them to make sure that they are aware of what the significance of these words and what the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation actually did for those final slaves in Texas. And just to, again, to set the context, do you know how long it was before that message made its way to, to Texas? I'm betting Robert knows that, by the way. <laughs> Well, well, the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect January 1st, um, 1863, and Juneteenth is 1865, so you can do some, do some math there, uh, two and a half years. So it took two and a half years for that message, which most of the country already had gotten, to get to text. Okay, so Nakia, let me ask you the same thing. Do you read these words? Do they mean something to you personally when you read them? Um, so I will tell you very similar to David, I don't read the word specifically, but being the mother of two black sons and the godmother of five black children, it is very important for us to understand our history, understand how we were brought to this country, how we engage and how this society engages with us as a people and why Juneteenth is super important, the fact that it took two and a half years for this message to reach the slaves in Texas just really mirrors how our societies have so many divides. And the fact that there was a act by the government to actually free and to abolish slavery and how it was implemented throughout you know, from the moment the act was actually signed and how each state was able to govern how they were going to en enact that law and how they were going to communicate it is important to our life today. 
how we as people of color and black people, and I, I am a black woman, so I will declare for myself, my race, that we are always fighting for the laws to be fairly enacted for us as a people in 2021. And so in 1865, it just reminds us that we've come some, we've grown a little bit as a country. We still have a long way to go in regards to equality. And so those are the conversations I have with my family and also have with my sons. Do they ever, I'm, I'm wondering if kids who, you know, now can like boop, 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 boop on oh, their gosh. phones, text. Did, I wonder if, you know, do they wonder about it? it took two years to get that message from here to there, right? What was that the idea about? and the idea of instantaneous, instantaneous messaging? Um, I, they, they have no real concept of two years. Well, what, why, why did it take so long? Right. And we talk about the technology didn't exist back then. Do you celebrate Juneteenth and um, with your family, with your community? And if so, how? Such a great question. Um, so it's very interesting. I, as our family has started to celebrate, I would say maybe three years ago, but we have always celebrated Black Solidarity Day and we've always celebrated, um, I grew up in Harlem and so there was always a African-American pride and parade that happened. And so we always honored it, but I don't think we called it out through it. When I think about my childhood, we didn't talk about it in my childhood, but it's so interesting now, my parents and I and the entire family really dig deep into the history and why this day is important, but why it's also important for us as Black people to acknowledge it and celebrate it and really lift it up so that the country will feel compelled to also lift it up with us. Which we didn't really until, what, maybe five years ago, 10 years <sighs> ago, even 10 years ago feels like, I don't think so. Like mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't really do that until somewhat recently. I mean, David, I, when we spoke yesterday, you were saying that when you were in school, this was not something you learned about, right? Absolutely. This was not something that was discussed. Um, the majority of anything that um, had a historical significance was more so European history, American history. Uh, Juneteenth wasn't really discussed at all from elementary school, middle school, high school. I was fortunate to have an African-American uh, history professor who, teacher, force of habit, African-American history teacher who actually made sure that he impressed upon us the significance of holidays that were not giving as much um, light. And um, I think for me, it just kind of rung home with me when um, I want to say maybe two weeks ago, my uh, son came home from school and he had a letter and uh, both my, I have a son who was in elementary school and a son who was going into middle school. And uh, they both had letters from their schools that stated that they are now going to start acknowledging uh, Juneteenth and they will acknowledge it as a holiday in their schools. And wow. for me, it was so significant because as you've stated, it wasn't really a holiday that was celebrated or widely known about. And so the fact that my son's school is going to acknowledge it for me means that the conversation is continuing to happen, which for me would connect what I'm teaching my children at home as you know, black young, I have, and I, I, I'm also like Nikki, I have three sons and I try to make sure that I impress upon them so many different things that I'm sure that I've spoken to friends with that they don't really have to teach their children. But my thing is, let me teach you, here's where we came from. We've had growth, we've had progress, but my children are, as you mentioned, they're on technology. So they're very aware of what's going on socially and they've expressed concerns, they've expressed worries. Um, and I have to kind of, here's where we were. So there's still progress being made. We're not where we need to be. We're not where, as you stated at the beginning, we're not in that uncomfortable place yet. Um, I think maybe as we continue to push the envelope, as we continue to foster these conversations, then maybe we can make sure that the envelope is pushed even more to the point where now everyone can feel comfortable. And I think the school acknowledging Juneteenth, whereas my school did not, is a big step in that direction. Absolutely. So do you celebrate um, in your home, in your community? Will you be celebrating this weekend? If so? I have been fortunate to, to find several events going on this coming weekend. weekend. So um, as, as Nakia stated, when I was young, we had, it was an African-American 
uh, cultural day or something like that, where all of the different auxiliary, you know, um, organizations would come together. We'd have a parade. We have, you know, people from the different community, from African American communities, kind of do something publicly, but it wasn't really titled Juneteenth. So I actually have the ability to take my sons out to see Juneteenth activities taking place this weekend. And I, I love opportunities like that to really get them to, I, I want them to have as much pride as I do about my culture, about where I come from, about the, the, the significant contributions that you know, African-American people have made to society as a whole. And it gives me such an immense sense of pride and I want them to share in that. And I think this, us you know, participating in events the coming weekend would be a great opportunity for that. So Leah Noonan, one of our colleges just put in the chat room, you were talking about what your school has done. Um, she says, wondering if anyone caught federal recognition of Juneteenth passing in the Senate yesterday. It is a law in many states, but apparently it passed the Senate. Yes. Um, any, Which is okay, Nakia, huge. any reaction to that, by the way? <laughs> it is. That is such a huge moment, actually. And I think one of the significant moments of yesterday that is connected to how our country functions is that that bill was actually presented last year and had no movement. Yes. Wow. They, we could not get bipartisan support on the bill last year. So I want us to also piece together the historical nature of who we are as a country. And so under a different leader, that bill was placed and tried to get through and there was no GOP support. And then this year it was able to actually have, I believe it was 18 um, GOP supporters signed on to the bill this year that was able to have it passed that the Senate. And it is moving to hopefully to um, the next phase and then it will be on the president's desk for a signature. But it's just also not only celebrating the fact that yesterday the bill got passed, but also how long it took. And the why behind that is also important for us as a as an individual, but also as a society to really think about because we have been through and have been through many years of racial reckoning, but last year really raised it to the global level that it should have always been. And the fact that last year that bill still like, couldn't get pushed through is very significant to who we are as a country and also hopefully showing that we are trying to move in the right direction under new leadership. And Robert, I want to bring you into the, you, when we were just in terms of putting a button on the celebrations and the way in which it's being um, acknowledged and recognized at the school level, at the federal level, you were saying that what's fascinating about it is how different states have incorporated it and developed their own rituals, which has a lot to do with how the message, the, you know, all slaves are free sort of disseminated out from Texas onward, right? So there are different celebrate kinds of celebrations in, in every state. Uh, yeah, so it's it's sort of the nature of the, the holiday. So it, it begins as a very Texas-centered um, celebration, obviously. It's, it is celebrated in Texas and there it largely remains. So it's not surprising uh, to, I see Francisco Miranda noted that she had not heard of it until 2014. Um, it, it is a holiday that has had a slow progression across the, the country. It remains largely in sort of Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and over the course of the 19th century um, until you get the, the push-pull factor of what we call the Great Migration the relocation of millions of African-Americans out of the South into uh, the West and Northern industrial areas. So the push of the Jim Crow legal segregated South, the violence of lynching, um, the, the restrictions of political rights, education opportunities, we can go down the list of Jim Crow society, and then the pull of jobs, uh, right? The, the, the industrial revolution is industrializing many northern cities with World War One in particular. You get this accelerated opportunity uh, for to make a living wage, and so the relocation of African Americans out of the South um, over the course of the the very late and early twentieth night early late nineteenth early twentieth centuries disseminates this holiday. So it 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 it's exported out of the South over the course of the twentieth century, and so it it creates this sort of um, 
really interesting local um, holiday because each holiday is celebrated. So I don't, I don't know if I want to be the historian here. I went ahead and pulled a Texas newspaper from 1880s. Oh, we which, love that. Go ahead. Um, so this is from the Brenham Weekly Banner. Now, all due respect to Brenham, Texas, I had to look up where it is on a map. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is northwest of Houston. And okay. so this is a, a, a white newspaper. Keep that in mind for the audience and the source describing Emancipation Day. Thursday morning, the 19th instant, meaning last Thursday, was the anniversary of the emancipation of the colored race from slavery and was duly ushered, by the, uh, ushered in by the firing of anvils at daylight. Now, don't feel, yeah, Nikki, I see your face. I had to look up what the hell firing of anvils <laughs> meant too. Um, it's worth a YouTube search, firing anvils. You put two anvils together with gunpowder in between and you blow one anvil hundreds of feet up into the air. Is it like primitive fireworks? Yeah, um, or sophisticated fireworks, depending upon your your choice. Right. Um, so this is so this is how in Texas in the eighteen eighties Juneteenth began by blowing anvils hundreds of feet up in the air at daylight. Um, I'm not advocating that, and if you injure yourself doing a June a traditional Juneteenth anvil firing demonstration, I'll defer you really? to Please Mercy's legal counsel. Right. Uh, <laughs> don't try that at home but that's how it began uh, a very large number of color people from all parts of the country were in town about 11 o'clock in the procession uh, arrived in town from camp town headed by the brenham colored band so music followed by the colored odd fellows lodge in full regalia so a, a black fraternal organization miss rb may goddess of liberty and maids of honor and carriage. And so their parade had a African-American woman portraying Liberty surrounded by maids. Uh, Felix Whitaker decorated float, a complete blacksmith shop. Uh, it was full motto. Uh, we live by honest toil and patronize home industries. The float was highly credible to Felix. There's quite a number of vehicles in the procession. When the fairgrounds was reached, the usual speeches and responses were made. W.B. Blount County Commissioner was orator of the day and made an excellent address, giving the colored people plenty of good advice. Again, a white newspaper celebrating yes. a white speaker. Yes. Now, this is where it gets interesting. During, Blount, uh, uh, during Blount's speech, Professor Robinson, a school teacher, made some remark derogatory to the character of the colored women. When a colored man resented the remark and Robinson was healed, proposed uh, he proposed to maintain his position by drawing his pet pocket pistol. The colored men soon made it so oppressively hot on the grounds that he deemed it expedient to withdraw as quickly as possible. Beyond this, nothing occurred to mar the pleasure of the occasion. The festivities concluded with a grand ball on the platform at night. The attendance was very large. There was also a celebration at Randall's Grove, Pleasant Hill, which was largely attended and much enjoyed till the rain about noon, which broke it up for the time being. After the rain, a sumptuous dinner was served. That over uh, Lafayette Kirk delivered an oration. It must be said to the credit of the colored people, again, 19th century language, that as a rule, they are very orderly, well-behaved. And during the day, there was only three arrests made. Again, a white newspaper sort of right. patronizing. Right, but, right, right. So I bring that up uh, for a number of reasons. One, the what I find really fascinating is that this holiday almost has, so to David and Nikia's point about all these activities, even in its origins, there's almost a frenetic energy to it. There's uh, a parade and a ball and over here you go to a dinner and at this, right, there's a multiplicity of events. And so you can see that this really is a multifaceted celebration across, um, it, it has everything. And so we can, we're sort of, the historical um, inheritors of that legacy where, you know, a Juneteenth, it's at your library and it's a reading. It's also the art gallery. It's also a parade. It's also a musical food. concert. It's a musical concert. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that that even in the 1880s, that there was this sort of um, I said frenetic, like a positive, like a like a positive chaos to it. That there's all you can imagine all of these people, their social calendars saying, oh, I'm going to go to the, the, the dinner. Then I'm going to the ball. Then I'm going to the oration. Then I'm doing this. And you can also see the problems of exporting that out of rural Texas. Um, one, I, we've sort of gone away. We, we've left the firing of anvils behind. I've not seen much firing of anvils. Um, and so you can see. So you're you're used to. Uh, this sort of celebration in Texas, and then you relocate to Nikias Harlem, 
probably can't do exactly the same things. Mm -hmm. And so it it sort of adapts and has uh, evolved as, as a very local celebration. And, and so it's, it's a really fascinating, interesting holiday, which I, I love for that reason that you, it, it's um, in our conversations earlier, we were talking about how it's not, it's not the same holiday across the country. It's, it's resisted homogenization that way. It's not even the same holiday across boroughs to Nakia's earlier point, I will still her thunder. And so that's uh, one of the things that I really find fascinating, and interesting about it. And that goes all the way back to its roots and the late 1800s in Texas. Right. So communities, different communities honor it and honor it differently. The Senate will see what happens in the House at the federal level. They may honor it. States, of course, many states have already made it a holiday. And Nakia, because I know we're going to lose you soon, I want to bring you into this on um, how employers at companies are also starting to acknowledge it and act on it with their employees. And you are someone who is uniquely positioned to tell us what's going on in that arena. Yes, so it has been, so again, but it's a slow burn. I love the way Robert said it's been a slow burn, but I do recognize and want to honor companies as of 2020 have been really empowering to recognize it as a holiday. So they've made the decision to add it to their holiday schedules. But for those, and for New York State, um, Governor Cuomo last year actually made it a state holiday for state employees and really wanted to take the lead on really trying to show what leadership looks like in action and declared it for states um, as a state holiday. Some employers who I, I have recognized and talked to, because again, in the work that I do in supporting the social sector, those that have not been able to actually declare it and add it to their holiday schedule are doing very intentional learning opportunities during on this day to honor it. So it's not a holiday, but they are doing what we classify as like interactive lunch and learns. They have made their HR departments really provide resources and share opportunities to celebrate, engage, and learn deeper. And so it's really become more of a learning moment in organizations for those that can't declare it to be a holiday. But a lot of large companies have last year really put the stake in the ground and said, we're going to stand up and add this to our holidays. And we are going to acknowledge that it should have been done years ago, which again, progress is slow, but it's always good to highlight those that are making the progress, but also for those that, you know, again, just because it's not a holiday does not mean your organization can't acknowledge it. And it's also an opportunity to really strengthen the inclusivity of your communities in each of your companies. I and so I am excited about that. The current, what they're doing, if they don't celebrate it per se, when they mm -hmm. turn it into a learning opportunity, are they talking about racial uh, inclusion, equity, the, you know, those it, issues? Yes, so it has been what we, I always say a lunch and learn is really about being very intentional to talk about the historical context but also putting it into today's light, right? Again, we have all lived through the, the racial reckoning that we are all going through as a country and being able to make connections to the events of every day. Because again, George Floyd was a major event, but it is those types of un very sad moments, unfortunately, are happening in our communities daily. And so how do we make sure that we are naming it and being very intentional in our organizations to honor, create space for the employees that may actually be carrying that burden and that weight of what it means to be African-American in this country. And being able to create space to honor and communicate and lift up Juneteenth is a way for employers to really say, we may not have been able to add this as a holiday, but we wanna honor who you are as a people and honor your community as a whole. And being able to do that in different ways is important. And do you believe these are sort of keeper institutional policies? In other words, this isn't just because we've had a bad year, but rather <laughs> they're, they're gonna make this part of their company's cultures in a way? I do. 
I do. I'm, I'm always very, um, I'm an optimistic person. I go through the world believing that people are good and that bad choices are made, but people are good. And I do believe that employers have been forced in some ways by their staff, right? Because now staff are really raising their voices to be heard and are expressing the desire for these opportunities to really become part of the fabric of the organization and not just a glimpse in time. And as David shared, the fact that schools are starting to declare this day as a holiday forces them to actually start to educate students on why this is a holiday, right? So again, just that alone, and if you think about the number of students in schools across this country, that empowers us in a different way, and they are our next generation of employees. And so employers are thinking about ways to be inclusive and to really truly be inclusive, not just in the moment, but building it into the fabric of their organizational cultures in a very right, intentional way. In a couple way. of generations, they're the generation of employers, right? They're the, Absolutely. You know, they're the future of how we look at this, right? And there's very different expectations per generation. As we all know on this call, there's multiple generations on this call and right. we've all shared in the, in the chat my son will, will grow up knowing this, will grow, have grown up knowing of this holiday in a way that I never did. Right. And so again, that's progress. And we just have as employers to keep moving forward as well. I am so sorry. I uh, have well, to I move. know I, I, we kept I, even I, longer than, the, and thank you, Nakia. Super grateful to be here. Thank you, Mercy College, for hosting this event and allowing me to share my insights. David, Robert, and Edie, I so appreciate having shared this moment with you all. And I look forward to engaging again. Absolutely. If not before, we'll see you next year at this time. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye now. I guess this is a good moment. We have a couple of um, videos um, of reflections, other reflections of people who have talked about Juneteenth. And the first one is also from a Mercy alum. Her name is Helen Bonner. She got her master's in education in 2011. And so let us cue up um, what she had to say about this holiday. And we'll listen to her and then we'll listen to another of our Mercy professors as well. This is a very pivotal time in our history, I feel, right now, um, and is a time for all of us um, to take stock in what we can do in the future to change. With every crisis, there's a <laughs> there's gifts that come wrapped in sandpaper, right? That because the gift is that we're all coming together in humanity to make a change. You know, we're more aware than we've ever been, you know, as, as a whole. And that's a great thing because you can't have change without awareness. One of the things I respect most about Mercy as an institution is it's a very forward thinking institution. I see that you always go the extra mile to position yourself in a, in a way that your students know that you're staying relevant with what's going on in, in, in the times and the way things are evolving and also to let students know that you see them that you which is which is the most important thing you understand this is what they're going to going through and you're going to address that and i think that speaks volumes okay that's what we would call the glass half full thoughts on this holiday but i am now going to stop sharing her and instead i'm going to share isabel grayson who also spoke to us about this holiday. And Isabel, who we spoke to, has a somewhat different tact on all of this. Yes, we have a lot to be happy for and to celebrate uh, since slavery times. We've come a long way, but we've We've got, I mean, obviously, this day and age is telling us the protests are screaming at us. We've got a long way to go. The ravages of racism are still rampant. And um, we, as, as educators, need to keep this conversation 
uh, between student and teacher constantly, actively alive. The book that I teach my students, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, which does uh, raise these uncomfortable questions, to say the least, throughout the book, um, she, Morrison, uh, writes at the end of her uh, prologue about racism and she says there is really nothing more to say except why but since why is difficult to handle one must take refuge in how right and you know i think you know i sort of uh disagree with tony morrison because i can't i think there's plenty to say and there's, we need to keep asking why, 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 not just how, but keep asking why. Um, and uh, in, until we understand why and how hate-filled power structures still exist today. Okay, so that would bring us to the uh perhaps somewhat uncomfortable part of our conversation, right? Um, I wanna ask both of you this, David, I'll start with you. So glass half empty, glass half full. We've heard two different ways of looking at that. Um, I, I, I'd say it's situational. Um, and, and, and unfortunately for me, as an African-American man, um, more times than not, I end up having to be a glass half empty individual. Um, my children, funny story, um, my children, um, as I stated earlier, I've had conversations with them that were very uncomfortable um, because, you know, they've seen people like Tamir Rice or Mike Brown or Elijah McClain, who, who are younger individuals that have, you know, suffered uh, police violence. And so once they saw fathers, um, Alton Sterling or, or George Floyd, as we all knew, um, Eric Garner, they were asking me, am I going to be okay? Um, am I going to make it home okay? Um, and my son asked me this question with tears in his eyes. And it was, it, it affected me profoundly um, because I realized he was terrified, you know, of, of me leaving and wondering if I'm going to make it back. And so when we drive, um, I've been pulled over um, before, and they know a checklist of things that we have to go through. Um, not because, you know, I've, do, I've done anything wrong, um, but because I want to make sure that I'm creating the safest possible environment for me and, and my, my son. We've been, we've had police officers pull weapons on us, and it was a pregnant wife and two small children in the back, and I rolled down all the windows just to make sure that everyone was safe and that they didn't feel intimidated or uncomfortable. So, there are times where I have to feel um, glass um, half full. Um, I feel as though, you know, what Professor Grayson said still rings true. I was in upstate New York um, and I learned personally from, from uh, Professor Murray about, you know, uh, slavery still exi existing in New York. And I was upstate in upstate New York and driving back home, it was really dark. I was trying to find a gas station and I drove through a town and I think I must have seen more Confederate flags in the upstate New York town than I've seen in my entire life. And it, it made me so fearful that I said, if we run out of gas and we're unable to find a gas station, we will sleep in the car as opposed to going to ask someone for help. That, so it's, it's still a very uncomfortable environment um, in society for me as, as an African-American man. But you know, I choose to try to force it to be a glass half full by being active. Um, in my community, I've, you know, been on on committees to examine police reform um, and then to be able to institute changes in my local community. I've taken, you know, the bull by the horn, so to speak, to examine, you know, practices to see how we can impact change, to see if, you know, we can try to to turn things, at least start here small and then try, I'm hope and the hopes is that everyone is kind of doing that, having that same approach so that we can impact impact change on a greater scale. I think the college is trying to impact change. I mean, here in Dobbs, I see the Black Lives Matter sign. I know that uh, students have um, have you know put together a, a peaceful uh, Black Lives Matter demonstration during the spring semester, and you know one of the results of that was that they ended up having the audience of the president and um, you know some of the you know upper uh, personnel staff at the college, 
And the goal from that, as I understand it, is to try to see as an institution, again, going back to what Nakia said, how employers can kind of make it more of a inclusive um, environment for students, and then how we can make it more of an inclusive environment for staff, things that can be instituted. I think those things will go uh, make strides to helping us be a more glass half full type of, of an institution in the people. Um, Robert, we're gonna get to, um, I, I wanna get to sort of the role of edu edu educational institutions in, in teaching this, in promoting awareness of it and so forth. But the incident that David describes that he went through, um, you've spoken about how this, the, the, what happened after Texas is that this moved out and became celebrated in many places, but that isn't the only legacy of what happened there, right? In other words, there was a, um, a, a darker side that also has followed all of these celebrations. And I wonder if you could take us back in history a little bit and tell us about that in 30 seconds or less, of course. No, I'm just kidding, but, <laughs> Sure. Um, um. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, um, well, uh, let me begin with, I, I love that Nakia, it, it, she's such an optimist, what a, what a wonderful person, but um, so let us be uncomfortable. It's not technology is not the reason why enslaved people in Texas did not hear about the Emancipation Proclamation. They, <laughs> that's not why, it's because Texas was actively rebelling from the union to preserve the institution of slavery and maintain these people as property. Right. And thus they did not right. the the problem uh, of the Emancipation Proclamation is that it only applied to areas in the Confederacy beyond Abraham Lincoln's control. It doesn't it didn't liberate anyone. Now, it does change federal policy. And that that's significant. We don't want to uh, underscore that. But it, if you read the actual Emancipation Proclamation, it excuses every area under federal control. The slave states of Missouri still in the Union. Kentucky, still in the Union. Maryland, still in the Union. Delaware, we always forget Delaware. Delaware, still in the Union. The Emancipation Proclamation allowed slavery to continue in those areas. It explicitly excused them from the proclamation. So, we, it, right, this is a, a legacy of white supremacy here. Um, it, we, we can't separate it. Um, that it the, the reason that this message resonated with these enslaved people in Texas is because it was actively denied and suppressed uh, along with their, their personhoods. Uh, and so that, I think that, that legacy is, um, it's important to recognize that this isn't just, oh, you know, these people had to get on a horse and carry a letter. Um, it, this, is, this was a war to preserve the institution of slavery. And one of the, to resonate with David's powerful story about upstate New York, which again, um, I lived in Connecticut and I had a neighbor with a Dixie horn. It was one of the bizarrest I, I, things I've ever, I didn't even know how to react to this person. Uh, like, uh, I can't even remember the show with the General Lee, the, the car, Dukes of Hazard. That's what it was. Uh, and so I think one of the things to understand about the historical legacy is that for many of the uh, union folks fighting this war, it's not a war for abolition, or it may be a war to end slavery, but it's not a war for equality. It's not a war for, um, um, you know, providing civil rights to African Americans. And so we can see the historical legacies even before the Civil War. So New York does not abolish slavery until 1827. It's worth pointing out again and again that, that in our own state of New York, the history of slavery is far longer than the history of freedom, such as it is, contested freedom. And so we need to remember that. When New York rewrote their constitution in the 1830s and they dropped property restrictions. So um, in the time of the American Revolution, the gateway to voting historically has always been owning property, uh, land, real estate. And then in the 1830s, there's this shift to whiteness. Uh, they decide that, that really all white people should be able to vote. And so you start seeing the, in, the inclusion of racial language in state constitutions. This happens in Pennsylvania. This happens across the North where they drop property restrictions as the gateway to voting and they add white. They intentionally add whiteness to property. New York doesn't quite do that. What they do is they remove property restrictions for white people and add them for African-Americans. 
And so th th this racialized language is present throughout um, the United States and understanding that historical legacy is really important to understanding how you have uh, issues with modern policing in areas that you said that you, you know, New York, ah, liberal uh, New York, Harlem is here. And, and you know, we have this, uh, you know, legacy. Uh, no, this legacy of white supremacy is right here. There is a race riot in 1863. We just call it the New York draft riots. It targets African-Americans. There are lynchings in New York in 1863 in Manhattan. And so that, that we do not discuss to your point about education, um, and that needs uh, to be uncovered for and discussed to, to make ourselves uncomfortable, that this isn't just a, uh, right, a celebratory narrative of, you know, kind white people, Abraham Lincoln, what a great white guy, uh, you know, freeing the, <laughs> the, the slaves. Uh, this is really a legacy of enslaved peoples manumitting themselves through the context of war. And it's really important to give them ownership and agency in that. So, All right, let's talk about how this gets, how this information gets out there and the role of educational institutions. And uh, so you teach at Mercy. What do we do? Let's start with that to educate our students about this. Sure. So I, I suppose step well, I guess I can, so I, I teach our African American history survey. Uh, we have, for, fortunately, I can speak most clearly, obviously, in the, the context of our history program. So we have uh, uh, just hired a, I do 19th century African American history. We just hired, starting this fall, a 20th century African American uh, uh, women specialist. And so hopefully we can provide more robust um, curriculum about this. Uh, when I teach, the uh, African American History Survey. One of the things I like to do is, and it, it, it actually, I borrowed it from sports radio. Believe it or not, the you know the Mount Rushmore talk where they talk about who are the four greatest NBA players of all time. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things I do is I ask my students: We're entering African American history to Reconstruction. Who are the four? You know, would you? Who was your Mount Rushmore of African Americans from this time period? You've had Black History Month pretty much for these students. Maybe they weren't celebrating Juneteenth, but they've had Black History Month almost their entire educations up to college. And we sit there, we get we get Frederick Douglass. We can get Harriet Tubman. Way, let me stop you. I, I want to see this in the chat. Anybody got contenders for the Mount, Mount Rushmore? Yeah. I'd like to see them in the chat while you keep going. Okay, yeah. keep going. And so what rapidly becomes clear to these students, despite the fact that they think they've had a robust education that, you know, we celebrate African-American every February, you know, all of our curriculum, very rarely can a class actually name four black people who lived um, from 1600 to 1870, right? Even David, like name, name four black people, forget, forget great leaders, just four. Um, and they, it's a struggle. We don't talk about Elizabeth Jenny Graham, who is the, the Rosa Parks of New York. We don't talk about James McCune Smith, the first African-American to graduate from a medical school. He's a New Yorker. He had to go to Glasgow. He had to go abroad. He was denied admission to medical schools in the United States on account of race. Um, and so the, it's, it's part of uh, the, the um, uh, to resonate something that David spoke to, and I'd love to hear more. He talked about, you know, U.S. history and African-American history almost as two separate things. And I think this is, right, a product of how we teach them. And it's per I love teaching an African-American history survey, but I, for God's sakes, we can, we can spotlight some African-Americans. Uh, that's okay. But too often, I think, especially in the sort of kindergarten to senior year uh, um, curriculum, African American history is treated as this separate thing. It's it's you have American history, which is just white, and you know Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, and then there's African American history off to the side. And instead of understanding that that this is actually this is the same thing, and this is that Juneteenth is American history, that this is who right we should celebrate this, that this should be commemorated, and they shouldn't be isolated. Um, Shout out to Christmas Attics. Nice. Uh, uh, so we're getting there. Sojourner Truth, a New York, an enslaved New Yorker. I had students uh, read uh, Sojourner Truth's uh, narrative this year, and, and the, many of them did not, <laughs> never heard of her. D a, learning that New York had slavery for hundreds of years, and two, that one of the most famous uh, women of the 19th century, arguably one of the the founding thinkers of Black feminism, she's a, an enslaved New Yorker from. Uh, uh, the Hudson River Valley, I think Ulster County technically today. So 
So are you seeing some of these names, by the way, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner yeah. Truth, Martin mm -hmm. Luther King, that's the, the yeah. only one I personally came up with, which tells you a lot <laughs> about me and how I grew mm -hmm. up. Madam C.J. Walker, Harriet Tubman, of course, that I, I might have produced that name as well. Yeah. Um, Robert Small. Be on your uh, on your Mount Rushmore. Um, oh, no, that, you would put me on the spot. Um, so I, part I, I like um, I would put Marianne Shad Carey. And I, I know that's a name. Everybody's going to go who uh, James F. Brown. Tell us. I like it. Good thing. So James F. Brown, an enslaved uh, man escaped from New York. He became a gardener in Beacon, New York at the Mount Gullion estate. So uh, Francisco Miranda's, that's a great trivia. So Marianne Shad Carey, there is, uh, so I study, my, my work is on colonial Liberia. That's a, a, a colony in West Africa established uh, by formerly uh, enslaved peoples and free people of color. I mean, it's now the, obviously the Republic of Liberia. And so the uh, I'm always interested in those African Americans who who think about leaving the United States, right? The the it's really contested in the 19th century about whether the United States is worth saving, right? Do we keep do do we stay here or do we go somewhere else where we don't face the all of these uh, issues of white supremacy? And so Marianne Shad Carey is uh, she's a leader in the immigrationist movement, the the decision to relocate, leave the United States. All right. And so I, I find those people really interesting because they, they engage in this question about whether the United States, it's worth staying here. Is it right. worth it? OK, so I know that we only have a couple of minutes left and we 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 have um, a graphic we want to show you that shows where all the celebrations are going. But I also see a lot of uh, mercy people, professors, staffers. If you have any questions. Now is the time in the next minute and a half to put them in that chat room of David, if you have questions of um, uh, Robert, if you want to say something, we can unmute you and give you a chance to say something. Um, they, nobody likes me here because I always run over on time and I do want to be respectful of your time, but I'm also dying to know what you think. And I won't call anyone out in the audience, even though I would love to, but I'll try to resist that impulse. Well, and um, um, if anybody wants to say something, I wanted to just add, hand and we'll come to you. Okay? I wanted to also um, add to what Robert was saying about um, the history classes in the fall. I know that students have asked me about um, additional classes that they felt would speak directly to them. Um, I've had students who've come to me, not because they were part of my program, but just because they felt as though they looked like me. And so they wanted to come to me because of a comfort. Um, I think that's also something that we can potentially look at. I mean, of course, qualified individuals. Um, I, I wouldn't have it any other way, but I think that, you know, additional ways to try to incorporate, um, you know, students uh, would be to, you know, potentially have, the, you know, staff that they feel as though they can come to. Um, I've had I've kind of take, I'm taking a page out of Felipe's book and, you know, Felipe Hanau, who's no longer with us. And he, his goal was to always try to create environments for students to feel comfortable talking to people that can identify um, with them. And I think that, you know, that's a great page for us to take as an institution um, moving forward um, while acknowledging and honoring and trying to be progressive as much as we possibly can. And, you know, Eileen Rothschild said, we started a college-wide book club on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's open to all faculty. It's interesting because the literature in some ways brings you into the history as, as powerfully as a history book does, right? I mean, Isabel um, had Toni Morrison, and I mean, there's a million yeah. books. Um, that, e that Edie, can I extend an invitation? And sure, Robert's involved in it go. too. Yeah. We've had we've had a book club uh, for five years. School of Education. We spread it out across the campus. The deans came to us last year. Number of people, including Sarah Martucci and I, Robert and Irina, saying, "Can we repurpose that book club? Have it on diversity, equity, and inclusion." We had three incredibly powerful sessions. Uh, they were all on Zoom, which we're, we're not sure what will happen next year. But we had very robust discussions on those topics with short readings. And they were poems. They were lyrics. Uh, we chose three books, uh, Bell Hooks, uh, 
lyrics and life of Billie Holiday and um, White Fragility. But we're open, we're starting to plan this summer and open to any topic related to this, any kind of readings, and it could be short stories, op-eds, essays, poems, songs, um, to have this kind of discussion across the campus. That's fantastic. So please Thank join you, us. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone because I really do want to be respectful of your time. David Collins, Robert Murray. Um, Nakia Jenkins, who's no longer here, but we thank all three of you. Take a look at this um, graphic there on the left, and you can make that full screen, Stephanie, if you want, for everyone to see. This is ways that are near each of our campuses, where there are various Juneteenth celebrations going on, either all week or starting on the holiday. And really, the most important thing is at the bottom of that, which is if you just go to a search engine and Google Juneteenth celebration, you are going to get a list that is so incredibly long and diverse and interesting from all different places. Um, and I think, you know, there's just something there for everyone. And uh, so thank you. Thank you all for being with us and for participating in this. Please visit um, this New York Public Library branch, Harlem, the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. You can see that in the chat. I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to, and then Arts West Chester, somebody brought up as well. There's just, there were too many for us to just share in graphics, you know, but um, take a look at the chat, take a look at um, the search. We, uh, we wish you a good celebration, a good commemoration of this day, this week. And we'll look forward to seeing you next year at this time. So thank you so much for joining us. And we'll say uh, goodbye for now.